What's going on guys? It's Nick here, back with the video. Today we're gonna to take a look at how my model views different year two and three wide receivers to try and find some breakouts. As many of you know, I have a prospect model that looks at college production and athletic data to predict how well each wide receiver will perform over their first three years. On top of that model, I have another one that takes this prediction into account, but then also evaluates how a player performed in year one and makes a new prediction as to what it thinks the best PPR points per game output will be in year two or in year three. So today we're going to take a look at some players the model is predicting will break out, but if there's any players on top of this that you know we don't talk about that you want to see the results for, you can see all of that on my website, thefezfootballvice.com. So uh, let's start off with the obvious ones. The model is predicting that Jamar Chase, Devonta Smith, uh, Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave, and Amona St. Brown will all finish with at least 16 PPR points per game in either year two or year three. Chase and Amona St. Brown already hit that mark in their year two season. That was last year scoring 20.4 and 16.7 points per game last season. While Devonta Smith was very close finishing with 15 last year. Meanwhile, Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave, both of course have not yet had a year two, that'll come this year, but they're both being drafted as top 12 wide receivers right now, which is typically the cutoff for 16 points per game. Like when you have 16 points per game, you're basically going to finish as a wide receiver one in points per game. So basically the model thinks these five, Jamar Chase, Devonta Smith, Garrett Wilson, Chris Olave, and Amona St. Brown, will finish as top 12 wide receivers in either year two or in year three. And that has either already happened or the market agrees is going to happen this season for the entire list. So, you know, everyone knows they're going to be good. There's nothing, you know, special that the model is spitting out being like, ooh, look at this, like Chris Olave is going to be good. We know that list is going to be good. Nothing crazy there. What I find interesting is the next two players we're going to break down. The model doesn't see a massive drop-off looking at uh, the last two on the list of five. So Chris Olave and Amona St. Brown were like the lowest two ranked on that list. It doesn't see a huge drop-off down to Drake London and Elijah Moore. It's predicting 15.6 points per game from Drake London in year two or year three and 15 from Elijah Moore. That's high-end wide receiver two production for two players being taken as wide receivers 23 and 44, meaning we definitely need to take a deeper dive into both of these players. For Drake London, uh, the driving force behind this production is twofold, right? First, he was highly projected uh, coming into the draft. Um, obviously, like the NFL was probably a little bit higher than my model was. My model liked Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave. A little bit better not a crazy amount more but it thought that both of those are better players than drake london uh but london still had an elite percent of his team's receiving yards in college he had you know a well above average touch share uh he was involved enough in the red zone and when you combine that production with the size and the size adjusted speed as well he has great size adjusted speed but also a 6-4 frame uh it comes with top 10 draft capital like you know the model is going to like you when you have all those things as a prospect. But what makes me excited about London is that even after averaging only 10 and a half points per game as a rookie, it was 47th among wide receivers last season. The model still loves him. And again, thinks he's going to finish as a high end wide receiver too. And that's because the underlying metrics were honestly just like awesome last year. 2.07 yards per route run as a rookie was behind only Jamar Chase and Chris Olave. He commanded a target on 27.2% of his routes run that actually led his draft class and the draft class before. These are two very powerful indicators of success in the NFL. And London dominated both metrics as a rookie. And when we look at his situation, I mean, let's be honest, he is by far the best wide receiver on the roster. So there is zero concern that anyone else steps up and really eats into his target share. So I get the concerns people have. It's twofold. It is the offense and the quarterback play. It is what 
everyone says when they're trying to take down Drake London in fantasy. But London really was just fantastic as a rookie. He's going to build on that success this year. And if you do look at it, if you're going to say, okay, Ritter's a problem, Ritter had four starts last season. London commanded 11, 9, 8, and 8 targets in those four games and averaged over 83 receiving yards per game. So it's kind of tough to say, oh, he can't succeed with Ritter when in the only sample size we have, he was pacing top five numbers in targets and receiving yards in those games. So I honestly like completely agree with the model. I really think Drake London is going to have a phenomenal season. He really is a great player. I think he's being undervalued. He's going to be a breakout. As for Elijah Moore, similar story to a degree. Not everything is the same. Um, my model wasn't as locked into Elijah Moore coming out of college. Um, it didn't hate him, uh, but it did think that there was a drop off from like the first round wide receivers we've seen over the last few years into more, which makes sense. I mean, he did go in round two, and I believe he was the highest ranked among the round two wide receivers. So still liked him, but it thought he deserved to be a round two pick. Um, what's feeding into the high projection though for him is the fact that he was highly productive um, as a wide receiver in college. I mean, he dominated in percent of team touchdowns, in receiving yards per team pass attempt, in max touch share and that's even while playing alongside AJ Brown and DK Metcalf when he was a rookie uh Jonathan Mingo the last two years but what gives him a bump beyond even that is that he was fantastic as a rookie and no one ever wants to admit that like the Jets just could not figure out how to get him the football but he himself was still really good uh his targets per route run trailed only Drake London and Chris Olave and the yardage would have followed suit, but again, when they were throwing him the ball, he was wide open. It would just sail over his head because they didn't have a quarterback capable of getting him the football. They had just awful quarterback play as a rookie, and that continued last season. And what gives me even more confidence is that we can look at the success rate research that Matt Harmon does over at receptionperception.com. This information is not fed into the model. So this is information outside of the model. The model already thinks he's a breakout. We're looking at more data beyond that that it doesn't have access to that says, well, Moore has been a dominant wide receiver over the last two seasons. Again, they just haven't had anyone capable of giving the football. He's got great success rate on a number of routes that we want to see high success rates on. He's got great success rates against man coverage. Like Elijah Moore is objectively a great wide receiver and is now in Cleveland. They're going to throw the ball a ton. It's a great upgrade at quarterback. By all accounts, he's going to be a featured weapon in the passing game. So he only has one more year to hit that 15 points per game projection that the model has. But I honestly would not be shocked if that came this season and he finished as a wide receiver two, even a high-end wide receiver two, again, being taken as wide receiver 44. Moving down a little, uh, one potential breakout that surprised me uh, was seeing Rondell Moore on the list. Um, I personally thought that Rondell was overdrafted going in round two. And while um, my rookie model thought that that was correct, that he should have gone in that range, it wasn't like overly excited about him as a prospect. Uh, and then, you know, as a rookie, he averages only 7.8 points per game, had a low 1.64 yards per route run, a very low 31 receiving yards per game. And yet, despite this, the model projects him better than Jahan Dotson and Traylon Burks when they're looking at best season in years two and year three. Now, again, I do not agree with this. I do not have more ranked ahead of those two. I definitely think those two have a better chance of breaking out than Rondell Moore does. But it is certainly worth noting that he's coming off the board as a wide receiver 60 after finishing 41st in points per game last season with now DeAndre Hopkins gone from the team. Ultimately, I don't think I can fully get behind the prediction. I like think he can break out in the terms of like, you know, being drafted as wide receiver 60. He could finish as the wide receiver like 35, 40, really just like crush that ADP, provide value on top of that. I still look at like Drake London, Elijah Moore, much more likely to have true breakouts where like one of them could finish as a wide receiver one in points per game this season. I think that's a possibility. I think for Rondale, I have a little bit more hesitation. Um, what the model really likes is that he had 
an elite yards per route run as a rookie. Um, a pretty decent 3.9 receptions per game. It came with, you know, relatively high draft capital, good college production. And so it's seeing that and it's like, okay, I think he can perform really well going forward. But remember that the model is looking at rookie year production, updating the original model. The numbers in year two for Rondell Moore were not that good. Like his yards per route run, targets per route run, those dropped in year two when you'd usually expect those numbers to increase. And I've also seen no indication he can be used consistently deep downfield. Rondell Moore is a player that, you know, I don't want to say is is super unique for the model. Like it's seen players like him before, but it's unique enough into where like if he gets a really high target share, that actually doesn't mean a whole lot for fantasy becomes because so much of it comes, you know, uh, really close to the line of scrimmage. Now, can they expand that role this season moving forward? Absolutely. And if that happens, I mean, he's highly athletic. Like he is athletic enough to turn any reception into like a 90 yard touchdown. So that makes him a really dangerous player, really high upside. The problem is I just haven't seen it yet. And I know that I know what's fed into the model. I know that it's not looking at year two. And if a player gets worse going into year two, that's not a good thing. And so the model thinks he can have a good season. And I know some people agree with that and really like him as a player. I personally cannot get behind that one. One that I can get behind though is Sky Moore. What excites me about Sky is that even averaging only 2.7 points per game as a rookie, very, very bad fantasy production. The model likes him more than Alec Pierce, than Josh Palmer, than Tyquan Thornton. That might not get many of you very excited, but all those players, you know, at least doubled his production as a rookie, which again, wasn't super hard. I mean, Sky Moore had 17 receiving yards per game as a rookie. So the model is looking at that and being like, oh, wow, that is not fantastic, but it's giving him a decent projection in the model. And if we look at his college production, makes sense that Kansas City liked him. He had a very high percent of team receiving yards, uh, percent of team touchdowns, yards per team pass attempt, touch share, et cetera, all the things that it's looking at for production. Then as a rookie, the total production was not great, but 19.2 targets per route run. That was a really solid number. It ranked right behind Traylon Burks, Devonta Smith, two very decent players, and his yards per route run were right behind Dotson and Pickens again two really good players. Now the chiefs, like they just didn't need him last year. Like they had Juju. Juju was great at filling that slot role, great at being utilized in like the intermediate and short areas of the field. That's where they're developing sky more to be best used. Now they move sky more all around the formation. He was used at all wide receiver positions, but he excels most in any route that's like working over the middle of the field, using the intermediate area. He's not really someone who's going to dominate on go routes, not really someone who's dominating as much as a true X receiver. But again, they were kind of developing him last season and they just didn't need him to fill Juju's spot because Juju was decent. Juju is now gone. And I really think Sky Moore steps into that role. And I think he's going to do really good, not just because he has Patrick Mahomes throwing him the football, but because he was really successful in these intermediate routes when he was given a chance last season and really just anything short over the middle of the field, he was good at, he was, you know, better than I think a lot of people think when you look at just the box score, the underlying metrics were a little bit better. Success rates were pretty good against press zone, man. Um, but what I keep going back to is the fact that he had awful overall production uh, and thus awful fantasy production as a rookie, yet among all wide receivers drafted last year or the year before, my model thinks that Sky Moore will see the biggest increase in production going from year one into years two and three. And if that doesn't fit a definition of a breakout wide receiver, then I don't know what does. And when you throw on the fact that he's also playing in the Kansas City offense and that we truly do not know who their most productive wide receiver is going to be, but we know that if someone breaks out, they obviously have a lot of upside. That's a really, really good pick to make late in fantasy. So those are some players that my model thinks are due for a breakout season. Though again, I do question the Rondell Moore prediction personally. If you want to see the full results along with a billion other pieces of content, you can see that at my website, thefantasyfootballadvice.com. I'll be back tomorrow to go over the biggest ADP changes over the last two weeks. 
Sunday for a very unique underdog draft strategy, and then Monday for another episode of Mock Draft Monday. But that, my friends, is the end of this one. Hope you all did enjoy. If you did, how about hitting the like button, and how about subscribing to the channel if you're new here. Thanks for watching.